Seaman. So, who do you trust? <laughs> You know, we, we, we were talking about trust earlier, like with the game, right? We were talking about updating trust. And trust is really a, matters about what context it really is. So uh, the friend I came here with today, Joey, who's sitting right at the back, he's a, a lawyer for medical malpractice for like bad doctors, which is not how I know him. I just sat and realized how that sounded. <laughs> Show when McKinney was not about any medical malpractice, but like I would trust him over legal stuff, right? And then not over medical stuff. It's very contextual. Yeah, if he if he offered to give you brain surgery. No, and I wouldn't. I also wouldn't trust the doctors that he represents. Yeah. <laughs> I, I came upon this this outlook, this philosophical outlook. I really like called like learned epistemic helplessness that I think more people I wish would be down with, where you just say, oh, I, I don't know anything. And so like, I'm going to let other people who, I, who seem like they know stuff, like, I'm going to pay attention to you both. If you're like, well, what? you know, I think that this rock is gonna heal my cancer, and I think that this rock won't heal your cancer. Wouldn't CNN be amazing if that's what people actually said? Like, I don't know, let's defer to someone who does Right, know. exactly. <laughs> let's find out who actually knows, and I'm just gonna try to trust. Uh, so anyway, any questions before we... I just... Uh, wait, no, no, let's do... Let's do... Let's do... Let's do... Let's do... You're also a white man. Oh, <laughs> a little less white. <laughs> okay, so what did you want to say? Uh, I was just curious about like if you were done and looking into like um, I'm forgetting what it was some Scandinavian country that started teaching like misinformation in schools and like media literacy and like what that does to kind of like I guess squash the misinformation epidemic and stuff. You can definitely start off by making younger people really discerning consumers of news and improving media literacy. One critique I've seen of that is that you can have people end up like me and just not trustful of anything. So I've seen that too, where then you become so skeptical that nothing is believable. So it's a really tough balance. Uh, that's what I want to the audience. I mean, even though if you don't believe, sorry, before we do that, even if you don't believe anything, I mean, like, you seem to be doing fine. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like, so open this up yeah, to Yeah, so we have time for like a few questions. Uh, raise your hand if you have any questions for... Suba, for Seema, anybody have any questions? I mean, you have questions for me. I don't know what you would ask me. All right, and over there, on the left. Okay, so for Seema, so like, in vaccine, in vaccination, like, there are people who have autoimmune disorders like that, like how do you handle those situations where you're recommending vaccinations but not everyone's the same, you know? Yeah, not everyone can get a vaccine, which is why we need everybody else to get vaccinated. And the problem is, like, especially with young kids, you can't be fully vaccinated for some disease until you're a few years old, so you're really vulnerable as a kid, and that's what that's when herd immunity kicks in, so this idea that you need a certain threshold of the population to be vaccinated, which then really frames vaccines as kind of like a civic duty, like being a good citizen, get vaccinated so the kid who has HIV who can't get that particular vaccine is protected. The kid who's on, you know, leukemia meds, the kid who has an autoimmune illness, the kid who is too young to be vaccinated, that's why everyone else is. And so often to me it feels like, oh, you're opting out of vaccines on the know-how, on, on the basis that others around you are going to be protected and they're going to break the chain of transmission, but you're not doing your civic duty. Do you have other Because this side is really curious, guys. <laughs> uh, let's, okay, there. Uh, for Suba, I'm just curious, like, where in Illinois are you from? And, like, um, the Jim Jeffrey show, and what do you like or maybe not like about Florida? Um, I still work there, so I would never answer that question truthfully. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the 
the Northwest suburbs of it, uh, like of Chicago, so uh, Mundelein and then Hawthorne Woods. And uh, what do I like about it? I mean, I like the jokes. Jim is like a great comedian. I like uh, having a stable paycheck and health insurance. So that's a lot of benefits. Flasher? General, uh, I guess, have you been able to find anything that resembles uh, a vaccine for information for like online, that kind of thing? Like, is there anything? Yeah, there's actually this theory called inoculation theory that a social psychologist came up with in the 70s which says you can vaccinate against the spread of misinformation. So this is being used by some people in like the democracy election space. I am trying to pivot those people to kind of work with us in the public health space. One of the ways that inoculation theory works is this idea of pre-bunking. And it comes from these political scientists who say it's easier to fool someone than it is to convince someone they have been fooled. One of the most recent famous studies about this was Brendan Nyhan. He showed people in his study an article that said weapons of mass destruction was found in, were found in Iraq. Then at the end it was like, no, this was a correction, this was not true, no WMDs were found. But when you then survey the people, they remain convinced that what they originally read was true. So they're like, no, 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 it was true, it was true, we don't believe the clarification. That's where the, it's easier to fool someone than it is to convince them they were fooled comes from. Inoculation theory is also called pre-bunking, and it's this idea that you can say to somebody, hey, this piece of information that says climate change is fake because of X, Y, Z is coming your way. It's not true. Here's why it's not true. Here's what we do know. Now you are better equipped to deal with that misinformation. I think that could work, but it means getting ahead of some of the myths and we're already way behind with some. Yeah, on, on that point, there's actually uh, the part of one explanation, like a cognitive explanation of why you would still believe something after you know it's, it's false, is the idea of this memory trace theory, is that the memory for the false fact is more emotional, it's more intense, it, uh, it's more likely to be encoded in your brain, because we remember things that are more emotional, whereas something that is not, um, and that's typically in these studies how it's presented, is afterwards you present a fact after this emotional thing, and so you remember the emotional thing, and you forget the other thing. So one you know, way to, to what you would do is actually change the emotionality of the thing that you're trying to convince somebody, convince somebody of. Firstly, what did you do with Super? Yeah, she's... <laughs> <laughs> I worry she when Batman would get disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> She had another show. Just check it. Yeah. Check it. Check it. Okay. I trust you guys. I know, right? One of the worst people to say that. I don't no, trust Mania. Um, <laughs> But last year, was it the year before, there was a really bad measles outbreak in Minnesota, and it was the worst measles outbreak there in 30 years, and it was very much focused in the Somali American community. And what happened is that community arrived, was got really worried that there were higher than usual autism rates among their kids, went to the Department of Health, and they were like, we'll study it, because that's the good scientific response. In the meantime, Andrew Wakefield, the guy who kind of started a lot of the anti-vaccine things, and another organization called the Organic Consumers Association, it sounds like just eat more broccoli or something, but they're really like anti-science. They arrived in Minnesota. They started having these town halls with armed guards outside that would not let doctors, would not let journalists in. And they said to the Somali American people, you are right to worry about autism in your children. It is higher, and it's because of vaccines. So the vaccination rate among the Somali American community went from 98, I think, to 42% within a space of about five years and really, really bad measles outbreak. And some of these people came from refugee camps where their siblings had died of measles because vaccines weren't available. And they were like, we thought we were safe here. But they were bombarded with this disinformation by people who gave them really well-crafted, really emotional, compelling stories that fit with what they were worried about. The Department of Health, you have to say, did their thing. They did what scientists do, which was take six years to do a study. They then came back and were like, we know you're worried but actually, autism rates are not higher amongst your kids. That's good, isn't it? In the meantime, their kids were dying of measles. So, uh, what is in it for... I know what's in it for Wakefield, I guess, because he has his own ego involved, but the other people who aren't Wakefield, what's in it for them? 
I think all sorts of different stuff. Sometimes it is actual business interest, as it was with him, because he had uh, investments in a company that was doing separate measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines. Oftentimes, it's way deeper than anti-science, right? It's anti-government, too. So it's people that are fighting against the United State or just fighting against the establishment in general. I mean, I, I think probably a lot of people actually care about health, right? Like they I actually care want, their kids. they care about their kids yeah. and they want them to be healthy. And I think this is actually one of the, the things that um, there's an idea that, so, so with trust, there's a couple of components of things that go into uh, people's assessments of trust. Um, one of them is integrity, is, is that if you say you're going to do something, will you do it? And there's competence, too. Can you do the thing that you say you think you can do, right? This is this example of, I'm a lawyer gonna give you, you know, offering to give you surgery. Is that person competent to do that? So people assess competence. So I think partially, when it, there's an idea that partially what's happening is that people don't actually, aren't always good at assessing competence in knowing, so for health decisions, right? If you think somebody, a doctor or a government, is not competent, then you're going to turn to somebody that you do think is, is competent. And they give you so many reasons to find, you know, so many reasons to not trust them. So we've been running a little bit long, so we're going to, uh, we're going to probably call it a night from here, but that doesn't mean it's a night. So first, first, off, uh, first of all, I want to give everybody give a huge round of applause to our guests. scientist who works in a STEM field, who is involved at all in the sciences in any way, either raise a hand or stand up if you feel comfortable doing stand that. Up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. I know you're all... Be polite, not everybody likes talking to strangers, but if you're curious about science in general, about anything we've talked about or whatever their area of expertise is, that's why we do the show. So stick around, have some fun, have some conversations, and play some games with us after, uh, after the show. Thank you, guys.